my faithful stagehand, Steve Stucker. He does such a good job. He is, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but he raises bees. And it's perfect because they all learn their behavior from him. He's the busiest bee I know. All right. So, you'll need to turn off airplane mode. <laughs> let's pretend that this isn't happening. Why don't I just trust paper that I have all my stuff in here? Okay, here we go. All right. That's what it looks like when you thought you were prepared. All right, good morning. How you doing? How many of you signed up for the blood drive? Have you seen the size of the needles? It's terrifying. I almost passed out just driving by the place. I'll pray for you. Well, you know, it's a Christian theme, nothing but the blood, and so, you know what? Like, you could do any better. We've been in a series titled Greater. Because we believe that God is greater, because He is greater, we can do greater things. It doesn't necessarily make us greater, but it does mean that God can take someone like you and me and use us in ways that are greater than ourselves. And he's greater than our past. He's greater than uh, who we are today. He's greater than all of the difficulties that we face. But it's so easy to get beaten down, especially these days. Well, <clears throat> I looked up what the definition of fear is in the dictionary. It is an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous and likely to cause pain or threat. Now, some of the most common fears uh, in America or phobias in America, are, I have just a, a list of a few. Fear of spiders, arachnophobia. Uh, any of you, buddy, anybody here play with spiders? Okay, one in the back. Get out, just leave. <laughs> we don't need that in here. There's, or, there's a fear of snakes, which is perfect. Nobody likes spiders and nobody likes snakes. There's um, acrophobia, fear of heights. That is, you know, you're afraid to get up very high and, and, and it makes you feel dizzy and so forth. You get vertigo. And, and, and there's also the fear of heights. Uh, can be related to people who are living in the northeast heights now that the crime wave is really <laughs> high. <laughs> It's not going to stop. <laughs> you can groan all you want. There's astrophobia, fear of thunder and lightning. Most dogs have this. Uh, there's trypanophobia, fear of injections. Okay? And if you have that fear, once again, the blood drives here. You can go face your fears today. There's social phobia or social anxiety disorder. There's agoraphobia, afraid of being in crowds or in difficult situations. Uh, there's misophobia, fear of germs. And there's claustrophobia, fear of small places. If you're single and you're living in an apartment, you probably have claustrophobia. Then there's the fear, fear of speaking publicly. I say all of that because fear is something that we deal with on a daily basis. If you're alive, if you're a human being, if your blood's pumping, you have the opportunity to fear throughout the day. And it's easy to get carried away by fear rather quickly. But fear has also been used throughout history in language, in public, and politically, fear can be used as a weapon. Using words, okay, just to categorize a person as fearful or dismissible. They stop a conversation and start the name calling. I don't know if you, how many of you spent time on a playground, but playgrounds are supposed to be fun when you're a kid. 
But back in the day when they used to let kids fight, it was a pretty cool time back then. I just got to say. <laughs> Hit somebody right in the head with a dirt clod. I mean, you didn't. I don't know. I have fond memories. But if, if someone wanted to dare you or tell you, hey, look, you can't do that. Or you say, I don't, look, I don't want to follow you. I don't want to get on that rope. Or I don't want to go do that. What would the kids say? Scaredy cat. Baby. What's the matter? Are you afraid? Little baby. And it's a way of, of just sort of using words against you and calling you out to be a fearful person. And that's what little kids do, right? But it's something that also happens with adults. I'm going to name a few things that are very uh, common today. I'm not trying to call out any group. I'm just saying, here's some terms that are being thrown around in the public today. Homophobic, right? You hear that a lot. There's being transphobic or even xenophobic, afraid of everybody. There's the term racist, and that's supposed to shut you up. There's the term leftist or right-wing extremist. There's also a globalist or anti-vax. Everybody's quiet. This is a lot of tension. So what? You've been dealing with it all week. Let's let off some steam. <laughs> I mean, come on, people. We're in God's house. There's vaccine hesitant. Oh, no thank you. And then there's anti-science. Are you anti-science? Well, I'm not. No, I don't think I'm anti-science. The, the, the idea is that, well, we're following the science. My question is, who is driving the science? And let me know who's driving before I get on that bus. Boom. Double tap right there. <laughs> tap on tap on that one. If you want me to follow the science, tell me who's driving the bus. Because there seems to be a lot of smart people in the world. Well, they're smart, crazy people. Okay. Maybe. But then there's really smart, smart people. And they're the right people. Okay, great. I'm still confused. Who's driving the bus? We have to make up our minds. And if you think that I'm making some kind of political statement, no. I am a person alive in this country, and I, like you, are having to deal with this on a consistent basis because it's taken over everything. That's all I'm saying. And I want to be able to speak freely about this in the church. We should be able to. Not worry about, oh, you're going to hurt somebody's feelings. Really? Have you read the Bible? I get my feelings hurt all the time reading the Bible. I think that's why God wrote it. It's like, wow, that's tough. He's anti-science. <laughs> Look, here's the point. This type of language is not used to engage in logic or further conversation. It's not, okay? It's meant to stop. It's used primarily to shut down opposition and to gain control of any opposition. That's it. Shut it down. You're bad. You're dumb. You're a leftist. You're a righty. You're anti-vax. You're a vaccine hesitant. Whatever it is, it's categorizing people instead of allowing us to be human beings who have a mind, who can talk to one another and speak to one another with respect. It shuts all of that down. And fear is a great way to do that. I know, listen, I think it comes from our parents. Everybody's parents. What was it? The parents' last line of defense when the child says, but why? Because I said so, that's why. <laughs> I don't want to have a conversation with you. It's, it, you know, it gets that way. But people want to know why. We're curious, and therefore, we look for answers. And it's okay to do that. Fear, when it comes to power and control, is a really big issue. We've talked about the personal issues of things that you fear, phobias that you may have. I don't care what, I don't care how much therapy you sent me to, if you threw a spider on me right now, I'm going 
to die. But when I come back to life, I'm finding you. I worked in construction for years, painting houses, spent all day on the ladder, terrified the whole day. It never cured me. Some of them can't be explained away. But once it starts moving into the public sphere, things get different. Because we can understand that fear can be used as a manipulation, a grab for power. Fear is fantastic that way. And we know that Satan is a big proponent of it. Now I'm going to say something that's going to sound really, really crazy. Okay, you ready? I believe that every believer, all of you included, is a conspiracy theorist. I think he lost it. He's going crazy. What's he saying up there? No, I believe it. We're all conspiracy theorists. And you say, well, I'm not. Well, let me read you the definition of a conspiracy. A conspiracy is a secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or harmful. Conspiracy theorist is a person who has a belief that some covert but influential organization is responsible for circumstances or event. Now, I know you're thinking, wait a minute, you've gone off the rails. Folks, I've been off the rails for a long time. Here's, here's, here's the problem. When we think of conspiracy theories, it's used as a pejorative to, because people start looking into something, trying to figure it out, and pretty soon they're pulling out the whack hammers and everything's going haywire. I don't know if you know this, but there is a group of people today in the world, and if you're here in the church today, let me talk to you afterwards if you believe this. But there's a whole group of people worldwide that believe that the earth is flat. I see a couple of people nodding your head in the back. No. <laughs> Think of all, I mean, I've known so many good Christian friends of mine who will spend hours on the internet and say, Dave, Dave, I just got to, you got to look at this. I'm going to send you some information. And then you quickly can kind of pick it apart and realize that doesn't make so much sense. That's nuts. But the problem is, is that it comes to us in our book. Think of prophecy. When I talk about biblical prophecy and end times, and we're going to talk about the end times and biblical prophecy, what happens? You kind of get excited. You're like, oh boy, this is going to be good. It's fun. It's exciting. We want to know, don't we? But every prophecy book I've ever read is wrong. Just give it five, ten years, and the government changes, and the people in the governments change, and the territories of the land change, and it never pans out. But it doesn't stop us, does it? You know why? Because God told us that behind the living, the life that we see here is another world that is conspiring on this world. Non-benevolent influences that are working against this world and his people. And because of that, and because it comes from him, we're more predisposed to this. If you don't believe me, listen to Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God that you may stand against the devil's schemes. Wait, I thought the devil was made up. No, not by the people who wrote Scripture. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full arm of God that you may stand when the evil day comes, that you may be able to stand your ground after you've done everything to stand. So there's evil supernaturalism. We find that in the Old Testament, don't we? There's angels, powerful angels. There's demons. And there's forces working 
on another plane influencing this one. So we are predisposed to wonder, I wonder what's going on behind the scenes. I wonder what's really happening. And I'm not saying that this is an excuse for us to go off the rails and come up with some weird, crazy theories, but it, we're sort of hardwired for this. Folks, we really are. Second Corinthians chapter 11, Paul asserts this. He says, for such people are false prophets. There's bad actors, deceitful workers masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. What? I mean, not everything, no, 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 not everything is as it seems. Peter goes on to say to be alert. Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil. Wait, I have an enemy? Yeah, you have an enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. That's a fact. If you are a believer and you, you believe in God and you believe in his word and you believe that his testimony is true, then you have to realize that we're predisposed to be wondering what is going on behind the scenes. He has drawn us into this as an interest and he is the one who has exposed us to this information because he wants us not to be uninformed, but to be informed. <clears throat> there's a, a type of technique that's used within totalitarian uh, regimes as well as just uh, advertising in general. <laughs> and that is the process of deconstruction. That is, they, they take your idea that you have and you think it's right, it's good, and then they throw doubt at it and eventually deconstruct it to the point to where you say, well, maybe I'll let go of it, Okay. Maybe, maybe I won't use pins oil anymore. They've said I need to be using a different kind of oil. I'm open to it. I don't know where that example came from. I should probably stay next to my notes. Anyway. So, so here's what happens. After you're, you've been challenged, like Adam and Eve, Satan's the best at it. Well, have you guys thought about eating that over there? Looks really good. I think it's organic. Well, God said, don't eat that. Oh, <sighs> there goes God again. I'm going to have to tell you something about him. He's a little insecure. He knows that when you eat that, you'll have the knowledge of good and evil. Hmm. He's keeping something from you. Oh, really? Well, I hadn't thought of that before. That's how it works. The upending of belief and the uh, commands of God. And then you're open to something else. And then at that point of your vulnerability, you can be fed almost anything. Because it, it can be better than what you had. That's a process of deconstruction. And fear is very powerful in that process. All right. Where things, where we should really pay attention is when, when things start to turn out beyond just the, the social and it begins to move into multiple people. That's when our antenna should go up. It should go up personally when someone is trying to use fear to manipulate you, right? Parents do it all the time. Well, you know, if you go out at night, you'll get the lot, lot of... How do I say it, Jeremy? La, la, you, la Llorona, yeah. I practiced it all morning and I can't say it. Say it again really loud so people can hear it. Yeah, okay, when I say that, some of you who grew up here are like scared already. Like don't go out by the ditches at night. There's a lady out there looking for a baby. Don't, it's just scary, right? But it's a great way to manipulate. And, and you can do that interpersonally in relationship. You can use fear. 
But when you start seeing it on a large mass scale, for the believer who understands that there is a true conspiracy of evil behind human events, then that's when our antennas should go up. When you see a lot of people being caught up in fear, all the same type of fear, and all of a sudden that fear is used to manipulate people and to deconstruct what they've been thought and fed something new. It is a power move that Satan has used from the beginning. It is a power move that evil regimes have used from the beginning. It is a power move that is so predictable. And that's what we should be concerned about. That's where our insulation built in by the fact that God can create in us or, or give us an awareness that there's, there's something else might be going on here. You see what happened after the French Revolution. You have, you know, Marx and Engel. What was Marx's big deal? His big deal was this. You know what? No one should have any property. No one. Because if that takes place, there is no real morality in that process. In the founding of this country, <clears throat> there, uh, prior to 1776, you know, you had schools started like Harvard and Yale, very religious organizations. But during that time, there was a, within the Protestant movement, there were tons of scholars that were super into Hebrew. In fact, they, they call themselves Hebrew Federalists. And they focused in on the period of time from the Exodus, when they left Egypt, the Israelite people, until the time of the first king, about around 400 years or so. And they had noted that during that time, there was no king. And historians have proven that they there were the only nation in history at that time that did not have a king. Everyone else did. What they had was a God who spoke with them, who related to them. He also gave them property within, divided up within their particular tribes. And because of that, they had the ability to build, they had the ability to be generous. How can you be generous if you don't own anything? They were told to care for those who were weak, to care for the stranger. They didn't have a standing army. They didn't have a police force. What they had were judges and leaders, and they had priests. And so here's the process. The priest would teach them the law. All of the other countries around that had kings, you had cuneiform and uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics that had very extensive vocabularies, and they were only for those in the ruling class and those who held power that never trickled down into the common person. Well, he comes along with Moses, and Moses comes up with a very simple alphabet. I mean, God tells his people on two stones of tablet what he wants them to do. And out of that became the development of language, and that language allowed them to read the law, to understand the law, and they were continually taught the law. And as long as they obeyed that and they knew that there was a God who was watching them, there was a God that had expectations of them, there was a God who put limitations on them, they would be governed by God himself. And the, the breakdown came is when they stopped paying attention to the law. And they began to do, as Scripture said, what was right in everyone's own eyes. And that whole process broke down. Now, much more detail. I may speak about it again next week, give you more detail. But within that group, you had judges who would appoint elders, people who had good reputation, people who were sensible, who, people who were fair, and because of that, they would let those people, okay, govern. 
something happened during that day in the city, they would go out to the city gate, they would discuss it, and boom, it would be over with. They would pitch in. They knew what God had said. And so here's what happened. When it came to the U.S., a lot of these guys were very influential, and they had churches, they taught the Word, they believed in education, and they believed that that would lift up people. Now, you're saying, Dave, there was a lot of shenanigans and bad things that happened. I know that. With every bit of good always comes all of the bad with humanity, okay? With every bit of good always comes the bad with humanity. It's just the way it is. We're never going to get there until Jesus himself rules. As good as we are, we bring the baggage that we have as well. Not big bragging rights. I just found it interesting that when they they broke up and wanted to decide for states' rule throughout this uh, country, they had modeled much of that on what they had saw during those 400 years of a nation being ruled without a king. Okay? All of that to say this, is that fear should be put in the right place. If you have fear of a conspiracy right now, if you're afraid of the government, if you trust in the government, if you're afraid of white extremists, if you're afraid of MAGA people, if you're afraid of the leftists grabbing your kid's brain and melting them stiff, let me just tell you something right now. Fear is found in respect for God, period. No matter what side you're on, no matter what side you're on, the way forward for the church, the way forward for Israel was to reaffirm the relationship with God and begin to push out the fears that were no longer truly viable within the presence of God, period. Proverbs chapter 7, verse, chapter, Proverbs 1, verse 7 says, For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says this, Don't be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. He says, if you, if you have to have respect and fear, put it in the right direction. All of the other evil that is produced on this earth is, is, a, is a combination of evil supernaturalism and humanity, human beings. God was calling Israel, God is calling us to turn back and put your trust and your uh, admiration and your fear in the fact that I own this place and all of you are on my property. That, that narrows it down on who to fear, right? God says, don't be fearing all of these other plans and schemes and conspiracies and machinations. Put that toward me Fear, don't fear the wrong things. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 says, For this reason I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God uh, does not make us timid, but gives us power and love and self-discipline. John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 says, There's no fear in love. Love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not perfect in love. You see, God says, I want you to come in and realize that I want to bless you. If anyone has ultimate power over you, I do. Don't fear them. Right? Don't fear these others. I'm the ultimate power, and here's the good news. I love you. And I want you to trust in me. You ever had a rescue dog? Anybody here? Some women are raising their hands about their husbands. (laughs) 
oftentimes they come with weird characteristics from abuse or neglect. And that's hum human beings coming before God. And he's saying, I, I, I don't want you to fear me. I am not like all of that abuse that you had. I don't want you to be afraid of me. I'm actually going to feed you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to give you boundaries. And I'm going to make your life better. And that's where we need to be. I love what it says in the message translation. 1 John 4, 16. We know so well, we've embraced it, heart and soul, that love that comes from God. God is love. When we take... When we take up permanent residence in the life of love, we live in God, and God lives in us. This way, love has run of the house, becomes at home and mature in us so that we're free of worry on judgment day. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ. There's no room for love. There's no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear, since fear is crippling, a fearful life, a fear of death, a fear of judgment. It is not yet fully formed in love. Jesus' love for you is greater than your fears. And because he is greater, you and I can do greater. So what does this mean? Right now you hear a lot of you know, talk about self-care. You need to take care of yourself. I do. I eat a cheeseburger every day. <laughs> Cardiologist says don't do that, but I'm courageous. I don't have fear. Listen, getting softer during tough times does not help anybody, okay? I don't tell you, <laughs> I'm tired of leaving a store, mostly grocery stores, and people are nice and they say, be safe, be safe. Well, what, like I was gonna eat a sandwich while driving recklessly in traffic? I don't know. What do you think I've been doing? Be safe. And we hear it on the TV. We, we hear it on the radio. We see it on the TV and messaging. Be safe. Stay safe. Stay soft. I would love somebody to, to say, hey, Albuquerque, be courageous. Get out there and do something today. Right? You leave in a store. Hey, be courageous. Stop being a ninny. Go for it. You can do it. Getting soft isn't going to help anybody. Well, instead of standing up, I thought it would be better if I just sort of set this one out. No. No. He said, your enemy roars like a lion going through and forth throughout the world. You have to put on the breastplate of righteousness. You have to be prepared to stand and stand. And when you see... Fear manipulating thousands and millions of people. That's the time to stand. That's the time to remember the law. Remember the word of God. Remember his goodness. And stand. Because he can make you stand when you cannot stand. So, what's today's lesson about? When you leave here, be courageous. Stand up. Be courageous. Stand up. Where you would normally shrink away, stand up. You don't have to be a jerk. There are a lot of jerks that don't stand up for anything. Be hopeful in your conversations with people. Be hopeful. Give, give joy. I mean, give your friends and people around you a big dose of hopium. Been waiting all service to get that one out. <laughs> People need some hopium today. 
Religion is the hopium of the people. Oh, you didn't get that. Stay positive. Get excited. Well, there's so much bad things going on. It's just so terrible. I know. I read. I listen. But that's the time to stay positive and to help everybody around you and say, hey, we're going to get through this. God's going to do something great. Hey, don't start believing the fear. Don't start getting down. Don't start getting defeated because the fear says, be afraid. Be safe. Whatever you do, don't be safe. Stop it. Enough already. Don't give in to fear. Resist it. Stay strong. And whatever you do, this is not the time to shrink away. This is the time to stand firm. Because God is greater. God is greater than your fears. God is greater. Therefore, you can do greater. That's why we're born for this. And you may be here today saying, you know what, I'm not a believer. I just came for the blood drive. I lost a bet with a friend of mine. or They're taking me out to Wex after service. Let me just say to you, I'm someone that's been a believer for a long time. All the good stuff and the bad stuff. And the further I go and the more of the arguments that I hear against the faith, I will push them all aside for him. Because countries come and go. Administrations come and go. Governments come in and do well or horrible for their people. Ideologies change. Fashions change. But God has been the one stable constant in this world. And if I allow that, that construct that he's placed within me, that he's given us in this book that nobody else has, anything like this, been given to the world, most influential document or library that's ever existed. He has set for us a way to understand what is going on. And there is an enemy that wants to cause us to fear because when fear catches hold of you, you can be manipulated and you can find yourself doing things that you would never do. God will pull you away from that and settle you within himself, and you'll be able to stand the, the, <clears throat> the storms that this life will continue to produce until he returns. It's a hearty faith. It's anything but weak. He just simply says, human being, if you can hear me, if you're even barely looking for me, you'll find me. And I'll meet you and I'll bring you in. But you're not doing yourself any good out there by yourself. Folks, pray. I'm not going to let up on this. Pray, 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 pray. Not because it's religious. Because God has given you an open door to speak to him. God has given you an open door to listen to him. And now's the time. Now's the time to put fear down and let faith be our banner. Father, we thank you for our time together. Lord, I want to pray for anybody here that doesn't know you, that doesn't have a relationship with you, and saying, man, I need that. I need it so bad. All of us do, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that touch their heart today and, and allow them to just reach out to you. We pray for us that <clears throat> we wouldn't be lulled into compliance with any fear machine. 
but that we would look on the horizon and look for your solution and stand by your power. Lord, we thank you for this time that you've given us in this life. And Lord, we pray that we would use it and enjoy it in your presence, in your house, in your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just stand with me. We'll sing. <clears throat>